very many slides, uh, but talk through them. And then if y'all have um, questions or comments, if y'all could um, hold them until the end, just it makes it a little bit easier as a virtual meeting. Oh, hold on. Let me record this meeting. I'm going to record. Uh, is it recording? Oh, it is already recording. Linda, did you do that? Thank you. Someone did that. <clears throat> so recording is I'm, re I'm, I'm recording it, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I just, your, I just wanted to make sure. It's a little choppy again. Oh, okay. Okay, so if it's, can y'all hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so if y'all just um, hold your comments to the end, or you can also put them into the chat feature. Um, and Linda uh, Stern, our um, communications specialist, she will be monitoring the chat and will help um, uh, share all the questions at the end with us if you, if you have questions or comments. Uh, please put them into the chat. Um, let's see. So we will be recording this. And so after the meeting, we will work to get it uploaded. It'll probably take early next week for us to get it uploaded to the website. Monday's a holiday. Uh, but we definitely want to make sure the recording's available for those who want to re-listen or share it with your friends and neighbors. Um, and then we uh, will also be updating the website uh, with a PDF of the presentation as well. <clears throat> so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. So my name is Jennifer Dyke. I am uh, the assistant director of the stormwater management program in the transportation and public works department at the city of Fort Worth. Um, so thank you again for being uh, with us tonight. All right. And with that, let's see. So tonight I'm, um, I'm going to, you. oh, I'm sorry. My wife hung up on you. So, I had to call um, you back. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, we can hear you now. So All right. good deal. Okay, so tonight we're going to just kind of briefly um, kind of share where the background information is. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of background information because I know a lot of y'all are very familiar with the background um, of the flooding in the Arlington Heights area. And we have all this information on the website. Um, so just really trying to focus on uh, what we've been doing since the last meeting and what our next steps are. I know that that's what is of most interest to everyone. Uh, so we'll talk about the parcels that we purchased with the FEMA grant funding. Um, I know that y'all who live out there have seen those right now. And then we'll talk about the notice of sale requirements for the properties that we're going to sell for redevelopment and take uh, questions and discussion at the end of the meeting. So, um, so just a reminder, as I was saying, we've got a lot of good background information on our website. Uh, we met last with y'all. It was last May. Um, ironically, so it's been a year, uh, but we have the presentation from last May on the website. So there's PowerPoints, there is a notes, and there's a recording um, all on the website. And so that goes through kind of a, a pretty good detailed background of the flooding, why it's happening, what we've been, uh, what we've evaluated out there, um, studied the projects that we implemented. Um, and then what we discussed uh, last year. So it's all available on the website. So since that meeting, um, we've received more feedback uh, from the community members, residents, developers, uh, council member Firestone, and I actually met with a uh, new council uh, member Hill this morning um, and city management. So, um, and then we worked to revise the notice of sale based on the feedback that we've been hearing. So really focusing on trying to balance the community cohesiveness um, for this redevelopment concept um, and while giving the developer enough flexibility to implement the concept. So we really want the notice of sale to be successful. <clears throat> In terms of uh, properties that we're, I'm checking my notes. Okay, I think everyone is muted, um, but if not, then, I'm going to mute everyone just uh, because there's a little background noise, it sounds like. So. Okay, <clears throat> so in terms of properties that are, so the city has acquired 11 total properties um, in, in the Arlington Heights area on Western and Carlton. And so um, we had our initial meeting back in October, 2018, uh, the initial public meeting on voluntary buyout. We got a lot of great feedback at that meeting, y'all. Our great neighborhood association or, or uh, yeah, neighborhood association and very, very active. Um, we really do appreciate when y'all provide us feedback. 
um, and that really helps us come up with a better project. And that's that's why we're here today. Um, so we went out there and we acquired um, nine properties with city only funding. Uh, we applied for three different grants. We were really hoping to get more funding to acquire um, more properties, but we did get funding from a FEMA grant to acquire two properties, um, a very good cost share. They covered, I think, around 90% of two homes. And those two homes, they were covered by the FEMA grant because there um, was the enough uh, repetitive flooding and flood insurance claims on those properties. And that's why FEMA uh, deemed it high enough to participate in that project and to, to fund part of those acquisitions. So um, all of these properties were voluntary acquisitions and these were residents um, in an area that just continued to flood over and over again. So we, we definitely wanted to work with residents who wanted to voluntarily sell their property back in this time frame. <clears throat> Let's see. So the two properties that we acquired with the FEMA grant funding, um, this is 2209 Western and 2217 Western. So they're shown here up on the screen. Um, and, and you can see that, I mean, this is kind of what they look like today. Um, so these properties are required to remain green space um, in perpetuity uh, due to the grant restrictions. So as I said, FEMA uh, funded this and the purpose of their grant program was to um, to demo homes with this very significant flood risk to stop future flood insurance claims on the national flood insurance program so to save that program funding and so that's why the properties have to remain green space um, fema wants those properties to be open to absorb stormwater um, and so the city cannot sell uh, those properties as well They've got it. Uh, one of the things that we did look at was, could we sell them for redevelopment to higher standards? Like we're going to do these other 9 properties um, that we cannot sell them based off the FEMA uh, restrictions. So we have gone out there. Uh, we had to demolish the homes and remove the impervious surface within 90 days of, um, of the city actually closing on those properties. So we've done all that. Everything's been removed. Um, we actually had Habitat for Humanity come out and salvage from both of these properties before they were demolished. And that was um, actually uh, some of the feedback that we received from one of the public meetings that we had with the community is someone had a great idea. Hey, you know, instead of sending all this great useful materials to the landfill, could you have someone come out there and do the salvage? So we worked with Habitat Humanity um, and they were able to get a lot of good usable materials from these homes. Um, to put into their um, resale shops and to use those and so forth. Uh, so that was a great idea from the community. <clears throat> uh, once we did the demolition, we added uh, sod and sprinklers. So we know that these two lots are in an active residential area. We want to keep them as nice uh, looking as possible. And we mow these properties every seven to 10 days between April and November, the typical growing season weather, weather permitting. Uh, so we're really trying to uh, keep them looking as nice and as possible. Some of the comments that we did receive, um, I know there's been discussion on, well, could they be used as pocket parks or for community gathering spaces? And uh, most of the feedback we received was, was uh, that, that no, y'all didn't want um, a large group of people or people gathering uh, just because you, you have your homes right there. And so uh, right now the plan is not to use them. Uh, they're just basically city green spaces. Um, we wanted to keep them very clear so you, you can drive by, everyone can see what's going on. Nobody's hiding on the sites. Um, so you don't see like the vegetation. I, I've got some comments back. Oh, could you go plant some bushes or put up fences in the front? But we really wanna have very clear sight lines into those properties. Um, so everyone knows you know, what's going on on those properties. Um, in the future, too, um, as the area is redeveloped on either side of these uh, properties, fingers crossed, is there is um, will be an opportunity to partner with those future residents and to enter into an agreement for them to potentially use these um, yards kind of as an extension of their yard. And so instead of the city maintaining them, uh, that property owner could maintain them. They could use them for vegetable gardens or, you know, yard space, play space for their kids. Um, and that way too, it would be someone very actively keeping an eye on those properties as well. 
Uh, so that's a potential use in the future. So I do want to throw out there that if y'all have any security questions or concerns or anything, I'll call the police. I think that's number one um, for not just these two properties, but the other city owned properties as well. So please call the police. I've talked with the neighborhood uh, patrol officer out there. They're aware of the properties. They do patrol them. Um, and we've gotten calls before um, on them. So definitely do that. And then if you've actually got stormwater maintenance questions or concerns or anything about the properties, please call the city. Um, tell them that you've got stormwater concerns on Western and Carlton, and they will direct director call to us and we'll call you back. So uh, we want to do our best to keep them as looking as good as possible um, until we sell them for redevelopment. But of course, these two that we won't be able to sell. So uh, moving on to the notice of sale for the nine properties that we can sell that were acquired with only city funding. Um, so the right now, we are selling all nine properties uh, together. So we did not want to sell individually because of the development uh, restrictions that we're putting onto these properties. We really wanted to find a developer that will take them all and come up with a plan uh, for all the properties. So um, the winning bidder though, they could potentially resell the properties. Uh, that's something that we can't uh, stop them from doing. But if they resell them, the notice of sale requirements and the conditions would go with the sale. So if they sell them to multiple, um, like another developer or multiple residents, maybe they want to custom uh, customize each new home in the future, um, whoever buys those properties would be required to follow the very same development conditions um, moving forward. And so we would be then working with potentially multiple owners in the future, but we're really hoping that we can work with one developer on all these properties. Um, this is a best value selection in terms of how we sell these properties, meaning that it's not just based off of the total cost. And I'm gonna go into uh, the criteria on um, how we'll actually evaluate the proposals uh, in another slide or two. Um, so right now we actually have an appraisal that was done last fall. Um, that sets the minimum acceptable bid price, which is currently around 1.37 million. Uh, but after this meeting, we will be working to update the appraisal. As we know, a lot of things have changed since last fall, um, and we've been working to refine some of those um, conditions and regulations based off of the feedback that we've received from the community. And so we know that that um, too will impact the appraisal cost. <clears throat> So the appraisal does take into account um, the fact that these are flood prone properties and it takes into account the conditions and regulations that the developer will have to comply with um, to build on these properties. And so that's why the value um, is, is a pretty good low value that you see there. And so, um, so that to me, if we can find the right developer to come out here, I feel like that this is a really good deal uh, for the development and the community. So in the um, in the guidelines, the development, um, all the redevelopment has to be complete within 48 months or four years after closing. And so initially, when we came out last summer, we had initially said um, 30 months after closing. But because, as we all know, um, things take a lot longer now. Yeah, there's labor shortages or supply chain issues, material shortages. Uh, so we really wanted to make sure in terms of trying to have the notice of sale as successful as possible, we wanted to make sure that a developer would have enough time to do the proper planning and engineering and so forth um, to, to make the construction successful and comply with our regulations. Um, I do want to say, though, is, you know, when I say there's 48 months, that's not going to be like very, very not likely 48 months of active construction going on um, on those properties. Um, but but typically um, that'll give them time to do the right engineering studies and put their plans together, go through the city permitting process. And then once they start building, um, as you kind of know, developments want to go as pretty quick as possible because once they're out there, you know, time is money and they want to finish that up as quick as possible. Uh, but it gives them the proper amount of time that they would really need to get that development in, in place. Now, we do have a condition in there that if they fail to meet the conditions, uh, in the notice of sale, that the city could buy the properties back for $10. Um, but we also have a um, 
uh, some language in there that allows the developer to go back and cure that. Uh, really, we don't want to buy the property back for $10. We want to work with the developer and help them to make this a successful redevelopment of these properties. And then, um, of course, the big point is, is that um, just, just a reminder, the developer has the option to either elevate those existing houses that are out there right now, at least two feet above the 100 year base flood elevation, the finished floor of them. Um, that's um, city of Fort Worth uh, regulations for developing in flood prone areas citywide um, is you have to develop above the flood risk. And so uh, they could either elevate the existing homes or they could tear down and build uh, new homes and then elevate those homes. So, uh, or they could do a combination of either or, depending on what, you know, what they wanna do. And so, um, they, so kind of the pictures that I show up on the screen here, the line here shows approximately would be the new finished floor elevation once the home is raised up above the flood risk, so two feet above the 100 year flood risk. And so that will result in these homes being around three to four and a half feet higher than the current finished floors that are out there. Um, and so the bottom picture shows uh, just kind of an example of an elevated home. So this is done very frequently, um, especially in you know coastal communities or city of Houston. Um, there's, you know, communities all over Houston now with all of the continued flooding out there that people have elevated their homes and they look really nice out there. Um, and so what we want is we want a quality, nice looking product uh, for the neighborhood. Okay, so um, also as far as the deed conditions, we're, we're going to have information in the deed because these area, the, the area will continue to be uh, flood prone and will continue to flood. We wanted to make sure that whoever buys these properties, it's already kind of a, oh, you know, why is it raised so high? Uh, but we wanted to be really clear that there's flood risk out there. So there's going to have to be a disclosure for future property owners or renters. Uh, so they're aware of the flood risk out there. Right. Um, and then uh, very, very importantly is that we want to make sure that the developer demonstrates uh, during their review and permitting process that they're going to have to go through with the city, um, that the downstream and adjacent properties are going to be protected um, during the redevelopment process and that they're following the right um, uh, engineering to make sure that they are not aggravating the existing flood risk uh, for existing properties. So what does that really mean? Um, they're going to have to demonstrate through their plan submittal uh, that'll go through uh, the development services department. So stormwater staff specifically will look at that to make sure that the project's not aggravating existing flood risk. They're gonna um, have to look at both, consider both the ultimate final development plans, um, as well as during the development process when they're out there actively developing and moving moving um, things around, uh, demolishing the properties and, or, or structures if they decide demolish, um, that we wanna really make sure that they're thinking about the impact of what if it rains during, you know, the construction process um, and protecting those homes around the development. A part of that um, is maintaining the existing fencing out there. So there's been a lot of engineering done on these properties uh, by Friesen Nichols, who's been our, our lead engineer out there in the Arlington Heights area. So they've done a lot of detailed engineering over the years out there trying to help us identify uh, ways to mitigate flooding out there. And what they found is that the fences really do control uh, the, the flow of stormwater through this area. And so one of the keys is during the redevelopment process is maintaining those existing fences that work right now to slow the water down um, as it moves through the area. Uh, also just maintaining existing flow paths around homes. Um, and so if suddenly, you know, you block off the whole um, the whole property with a structure and you don't allow the stormwater to flow around it like it does today, of course, that water is going to want to go somewhere else onto another property. So we want to make sure that the stormwater continues to be able to uh, flow downhill. Um, also, they're going to need to maintain or offset any new impervious hard surfaces on their property. Uh, so this is really important, just trying to make sure that there is um, a similar amount of land that can continue to absorb uh, the stormwater from when it rains. Um, and then also just no significant 
grading changes can be made. So we don't want to change the grading significantly. So suddenly the water goes off onto somebody else's property. So looking at the uh, redevelopment guidelines in the notice of sale. So um, these really consider input from Arlington Heights property owners that we've received over the last few years uh, from the community. And so uh, the developers plans are going to be reviewed for compliance with uh, the guidelines in the conditions documents. Um, and we're going to have that. We actually have it posted on our website right now, um, the draft document. And so I'll, I can show you afterwards where to find that if you want to go and look at it in detail. Uh, but before the city actually issues a building permit um, and signs off on the final inspection, uh, we'll like as a part of that process, we'll have to say, yes, they comply with these notice of sale um, guidelines. Um, so, as I said earlier, as we really work to balance community cohesiveness with giving the developer enough flexibility uh, to implement their development plans. So, we wanted this to be successful um, and we know that it's, it's going to be challenging because of the flooding that's going out there and the size of the lots. Um, so, this right now um, is a 5 single family zoning. So, that'll be uh, required to kept in the future. So, no rezoning, uh, no replatting. Um, so. The exception is that there is an existing duplex on Western and um, to my understanding, I, I talked with development services and if that duplex is elevated, then it can remain a duplex. But if it's, if it's torn down, it would then need to become a single family residential home. Um, having uh, the developer observe is this existing front rear and side yard building setbacks as much as possible. So again, trying to, um, maintain a similar amount of impervious surface and those flow paths um, around the properties, trying to maintain the existing look and feel um, of the, the current neighborhood. Um, and, and again, kind of the same here is just having the size and scale of the homes, um, trying to be as similar as possible with the, um, the, the homes up and down the rest of those streets. <clears throat> And then again, similar with that, having the, the facades look like um, the, the other homes up and down the street. So trying to maintain harmony there. Um, and then two, uh, we received a lot of feedback about the garages, how the garages are typically in the back of these properties. And so we put that into uh, the standards that, you know, garages at the rear of the lots are okay, carports at the rear are okay, but not right up there um, in the front. To maintain that current look and feel. Um, so, how are we going to select and review these proposals and then select uh, who we actually uh, sell the properties to? So, as I said earlier, we're looking at a best value selection, which means that other factors besides price are considered. And so, um, the best value bidder will be the bidder who gets the most points, not necessarily that has the highest price. Uh, so we're going to go off a hundred point system. So 70 points goes for the highest bid um, with that appraisal setting the minimum amount of the bid. And then we'll have a sliding scale going from there. Then um, they can get up to 20 points if they actually elevate um, the existing homes versus tear down and build new homes. And we did that because we heard from the community how important it was to maintain those existing structures and the look and feel as much as possible versus putting in a new home. So we wanted to um, give them points if they kept those existing homes. Um, so they would get four points for these four homes that are shown on the screen. And these were identified in discussions with the, um, the community members um, in coordination with our historic preservation office that these homes uh, really felt like that they they were quality construction and, and they were a, a, a higher value to maintain those and elevate them versus to tear down and rebuild. So they would get more points if they um, elevate those homes, uh, one point for the other four homes if they elevate those, no points for uh, 2205 Western because that's a new build um, slab on grade. So uh, no extra points uh, to elevate that because it's just, it's a new home. And then they would get up to 10 points or the degree to which the bid addresses other community preferences. So working with the community, um, we uh, had a list of what is important from the community, but not, uh, not a requirement of the development. So we, it's more 
Um, these are things that the community would like to see, but it's not required. And so we can um, look and see in terms of tree preservation, you know, are they planning just to take down all the trees and start from scratch and rebuild? Um, or are they planning to try to keep those trees on the site? And I know there's a lot of great trees on this site that we would really like to see uh, remain. I know I, I know I love my trees in my neighborhood. Um, and so, so that's the hope is that a developer would choose to work around uh, the trees, if at all possible, uh, would they be willing to put in bioswales, uh, use permeable pavement, um, you know, put rain barrels on the homes? Um, they could elevate following Secretary of Interior um, Interior Standards. So that's more uh, a, a, a little bit different in terms of historical preservation. So really trying to, um, uh, to keep the integrity of the structure more. Um, so they would get points. Uh, they could get uh, some of these points for this. Um, and so basically what we're, we're planning to do is to form a small group of community uh, stakeholders that would assign these um, points to this. So basically the community group would have, um, I think like four, a core to exceptional. So I think it'll be exceptional, um, you know, great. I, I can't remember like the, the range, but the community group, we want that group to actually assign the, the score and then the city will put points to that score um, for this part of the evaluation system. Um, and the plan is to have the majority of the members on that um, group to live on Western and Carlton on that impacted block. So we really wanna make sure that we're hearing from the residents that will be most impacted uh, by the development. And so the thought is to have four Western and four Carlton property owners, as well as two members representing the neighborhood association at large. Um, and I know that there's a lot of interest on, you know, can I be on that group? Um, and so if you're interested, um, definitely reach out, send me an email. Uh, so the, the plan is to put together a list of who's interested, and then we're just gonna have to work on what's the best way to narrow down that list, uh, really trying to focus on, on the, the property owners that live closest to those structures. So what's our next steps? Um, so basically after today's meeting, uh, I would like to um, get any final questions and feedback by next Friday. So giving everyone a week to, um, you know, think about what was um, talked about today, to look at the draft, um, conditions on our website, uh, send us any final questions, and then we will look and see if we need, if we uh, think we should tweak anything else, and then we will finalize those conditions and give it to the appraiser, and the appraiser is going to update their appraisal based off of both the changing market conditions as well as the updated guidelines and conditions. Um, so we need to have a, a final set so they can consider that when they value the property. Um, so that'll take around 30 days. So we think probably probably around the month of June um, is the appraisal would be updated. And then the plan is in July to actually issue the notice of sale. So the plan is to issue it for 100 days. So initially when we met with y'all last year, we planned to issue it for 60 days, but there was um, a lot of questions and concerns um, and feedback that it would be very challenging for a developer to uh, be able to evaluate these properties and figure out their plan and figure out what they would like to bid on them in 60 days. And so again, you know, we're trying to make this as feasible as possible. We want the notice of sale to be successful. And so uh, based off of the feedback we received, we revise that to be 100 days. So we really want that notice of sale out there to try to reach as, as many developers and give them enough time to come up with a bid for these properties. Um, and we are also going to be asking our city development community and historic community groups to really help us advertise. Um, so we really try to wanna, wanna get the word out, you know, that this is a different, um, a different development idea out there um, and try to reach as many potential developers as possible. Also, we're going to be, um, having two half days out there um, during this 100 days. So it'll be pretty early on 
where um, people who are interested in bidding can come out, they can take a look at the properties, they can walk through the homes, look at the yards, um, to kind of get a better look and feel of that area to help them to, to decide um, if and how they want to bid on these properties. And then um, after the 100 days is complete, which will probably be in November timeframe, um, so we would basically then start to evaluate the bids that we received and determine if there's a viable bidder. Um, so we're really hoping that there's a viable bidder. Um, the city can reject um, all the bids if we look at them um, and just nothing looks uh, looks like it's going to be feasible. We can reject for any reasons, um, but we really are hoping that we get some good feasible um, redevelopment opportunities out there. And so that that's what we're really hoping for. Uh, we're hoping that we can move forward um, with with a successful uh, bidder. Um, and then with that, then we would move forward uh, with the sale of the property. Um, it would have to go to uh, city council for approval, of course, um, but that's what we'd be moving forward to uh, to sell to the viable bidder that we've been uh, identified, hopefully early next year, just looking at the timeframes. Um, so I do wanna say that if we don't um, get any viable bids, um, the city would then go back to the initial green space and detention option that we looked at um, several years ago uh, for this. And so uh, that was part of the discussion is when we started the voluntary buyout, would we actually get enough properties that we could possibly then take those properties if they're all side by side and construct a stormwater detention basin out there that could be used both for um, mitigating flood risk to property owners downstream, as well as for uh, recreational uses like walking trails or just, you know, sitting outside, uh, taking a place to take your dog um, when it's nice out. And so, um, and, and that's where we got more feedback, though, that uh, the redevelopment was of interest to more uh, residents and property owners um, in the neighborhood. And so that's why we're moving forward with the redevelopment option. Uh, but I do want to let everyone know that if, if that doesn't work out, then what we'll do is we will work with um, the community. We'll have, I'm sure, uh, several meetings. We will want to get community feedback on the design of the stormwater detention basin um, and move forward with that concept. So, but, but I'm really hoping that we can make this uh, redevelopment successful. So with that, I think that's my last slide. Yeah, uh, that's my last slide. And so um, we'll take questions right now. And if you um, haven't put them, start to put questions in the chat. Um, or if you would like to ask a question verbally, um, then you can, uh, we can try to take turns and you can turn on your microphone um, and ask your questions verbally. Um, as I said earlier, um, if we don't get to all of your questions or comments, Oh, yeah, you can also raise your hand. Linda's saying there's like a little hand button, then you can say raise your hand and we'll call on you to ask your question. Um, but if y'all could get any questions or comments um, back to me by next Friday, um, that will help us then to finalize the document and then move forward with the um, update on the appraisal. As I mentioned, this is our website up here on this on the screen. And if you go to it right now, um, it actually does have the draft uh, conditions document. If you go down to the bottom of the website, um, let's see if I can, oh look, yeah. So here's the top of the website. And if you scroll down under design standards and guidelines, this is where the document is right now that you can go and you can look at that um, information that I just summarized. So with that, um, Linda, why don't we start with the chat? Okay. So, Mr. Matt Motes had two questions, and I believe his first question was answered during the course of your presentation. He had asked for all nine properties, and I'm assuming, Mr. Motes, you meant that in regards that we would be selling all nine properties? Correct. So, so we would sell, going back to this slide right here, so these nine, the ones in blue are the ones that would be sold for redevelopment, and the ones that are in green um, are the two that were acquired with FEMA grant funding that we have to uh, remain green space. So good question, because I didn't really explain the colors earlier. And then his second question right after that, um, he asked if there was a minimum square footage requirement, which I believe was when you were talking about redevelopment of these properties. 
Um, so yeah, no, there's not a, a minimum square footage requirement. It, I mean, the key is really um, trying to replicate the, the current situation out there in terms of drainage and impervious surface um, and, and have something very similar in the future. So if you take a really, really small um, you know, house out there and suddenly you build this giant and you cover the whole lot with concrete, um, then that has a greater potential for flooding. And so that's the biggest thing is, is we really want to make sure that these developers are looking at it and evaluating um, the potential for increasing the flood risk. We don't want that to happen. Okay. So then Ms. Carrie Richards had um, two comments. One is in regards to during the presentation and you're talking about uh, redevelopment versus green space. Um, she's saying that it is not true. More people signed the petition in favor of the green space and that would benefit more people. Right, so there was actually a lot of different, uh, there was a survey that was put out by kind of two groups in the community after our meeting last May. Um, and so there was a lot of, I will say there was a lot of support honestly for both options, but it seemed like that there was more support uh, for the uh, redevelopment concept. And so based off that, we took both sets of feedback um, to the council member at the time, it was council member Firestone, all the way up to uh, the city manager to make sure that they understood both sides um, of the concern. We wanted it to be very clear with our upper management and council members uh, what we were hearing from the community and that there was support for both concepts. Um, and so we listened to everyone's feedback um, and the decision was made to move forward with the redevelopment option. Which that was a follow up question that Carrie had. Um, then a third from um, Carrie is if our flooding gets worse after the homes are built, what can existing homeowners do as a recourse? So, so the whole hope is that these, the city has very, uh, very good development regulations in place right now. And then the ones that we're putting in place uh, with this notice of sale, we've even set some higher standards there, uh, really requiring someone to look in more detail at like during the construction process at those interim conditions. So, so the whole, the whole purpose of that is so the existing flooding doesn't get aggravated. Um, but, you know, residents always have the recourse to go after um, that developer or property owner, or whoever is redeveloping the property. Uh, but we put these um, guidelines and restrictions in place to keep com the community members safe and to make sure that that new development that goes in is built safe from flooding, as well as that it doesn't aggravate the existing flood risk for the people who live there right now. Hey, Jennifer, it's Wiley. I got a couple of questions for you. Good evening. Okay. Thanks for doing this. Um, sure. On the developer point, who's going to be monitoring the developers during that, that 40 months? Like, who's going like, to check on them? Who's going to make sure they're hitting all the points and the things that they put in their original kind of bid? Who's like going to be the person in charge of doing that part? Right. So they'll have to go through uh, our development services department. Um, and, and part of that is, is once we move forward with the developer, we want to have a meeting at the very beginning, um, you know, and just make sure that everything is very clear to them in terms of what they're going to have to meet. Um, and then again, too, if they sell, we just want to make sure that there's no surprises out there um, of what they're required to meet. So that'll be the key is to meet with them early on in the process. Uh, we'll be flagging these in our development review system. So uh, so if they're sold or if new property owners or developers come forward, um, it's very clear that these are tagged with very special development regulations that are going to require a higher level of commitment by the city to make sure that everything um, you know, moves forward smoothly and is abided by. Gotcha. I think my, so my concern is living right across from them, you know, the streets not super wide here in Carrollton already and there's fire trucks that come through there's kids playing like like if something like that happens like is there somebody I can reach out to and be like hey listen there's a dump truck here since some you know until 7 p.m 8 p.m 
blocking the road? Like, what are we going to be able to do for those like three years that there could be potential stuff? Is, is there some recourse there? Um, so, so definitely what we'll have to do is we, uh, we'll have to find, you know, the best, I would say the best number, you know, that you can call. So you can talk to someone, um, and, and once the development moves forward, um, I think having, you know, a, here's kind of a main point of contact who's very familiar with these regulations. I think that's what we'll need to have. I don't want to say who that is right now. Uh, just because of the turnover and we don't know when this is going to kick off, but I think it would be good to have someone that is kind of like, this is the prime. They know this like in and out. Um, and this is who you can call if you've got questions or concerns. Yeah. Cause I think like the, the, on Camp Bowie, the hotel being built there, you know, they can only bring trucks at certain hours of the day. There's certain development where they have to park to do things. Like there's not really a parking lot near here kind of logic that they can just kind of go from so I, that yeah if we didn't think about that down the road Jennifer, that'd be really good um, yeah that's really good feedback the, the second thing that you mentioned that you might says when they said the minimum square foot is there a maximum square foot that they can make it i, I apologize being that earlier yeah no there's not a maximum either so because they could build like some of these houses are one story so they could build a second story um and so that it that is uh, part of what could make the development more attractive to instead of you know, elevating the existing home, um, you know, to tear down and rebuild and have a two story home. So, because it, it's hard to add that additional impervious surface out there um, without um, adversely impacting the existing flood risk. So, if they can't make that happen, um, building up then gives them more square footage and the ability right. to, to sell and make that profit. So, we wanted basically it to be very flexible for them. And, and this might be a dumb question, but seal family home, can it go over two lots? Could they make one that covered two lots? Is that that's that's outside yeah. family home, right? Yeah, that's kind of that the the no replatting. So yeah, that's the no replatting. That's that means. Okay, I don't know that term, so that helps. Yep. Okay, good question. Right. Good very, question. Very last question. You mentioned like the fencing. I've noticed like some of the stuff is starting to fall apart back there. If they wanted to rebuild the fence, could they do it? Could they fix the fences? Like. Some of the houses, especially on the western side, are getting a little rough because they've been sitting there empty. There's animals, there's holes, there's things like that. Like, I can see it with the oh, fences yeah. too, needing some repairs or even maybe tear down and put a new fence. So, just right. just a so, thought, like if that's a possibility in some of the lots. Yes, yeah, definitely. So, so part of the um, regulations will say they have to maintain the fencing. Um, and so, you know, if the fences get knocked down from the flooding or they fall down because they're in disrepair, we're going to make them uh, put them back up. So basically they need to remain in place or, I mean, they could shift, you know, a little way one way or the other, you know, if they're not right on the right property lines. Um, but yes, that, that will be something that they're required to do is to maintain those existing fencing, but they can. Um, they can uh, re like put up better fencing, you know, in terms of when they go to sell, you know, I'm sure like who wants to buy a, a nice new house with a crappy looking fence. Um, gotcha, yeah. that would be so that is yeah, good something. amend, but they can't make it less. They have to either make it nicer or more basically. Correct. Correct. We okay. want them to okay. kind of replace with the same similar type of fence because it's providing that same type of uh, flood control measure that it currently is. Okay. Awesome. And I, probably, I remember one last question. I promise. Last one. Is this the only bid that will happen? So if it gets past 100 days and we don't have a score, like we're not going to be like, let's reopen it. Is this, is it a one and done? Correct. Window, correct. Basically? Okay. Yeah. So that's the plan is, is, yeah, we don't want to continue to go back. Well, what if we change this or what if we change that? Right. So we want to do it right the first time. It and that's up, why that's we're the window, and then we're moving on after that kind of logic. Correct. Okay. Correct. And so part of it, um, when we have the, um, the site visit that I mentioned earlier, it kind of, it's like this pre bid meeting. So the developers will have a certain time frame at the beginning where they can provide us with, you know, questions or comments, um, and we could potentially do some amendments. So maybe we get some really good feedback that makes us say, okay, let's do an addendum for, to this, okay. um, and change something at the very beginning because we're getting some comments and concerns and we realize, okay, we need to tweak something to, to make sure that this is viable. Um, so we will consider that, but it's not going to be something where we go through the whole process. And then at the end, we don't get anything. And well, let's like start all over. We don't want, cause that could just go on forever and ever. Right. Right. Okay. Perfect. All right. That's all mine. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming. Jennifer, come back to. Thank you. Going back to 
the chat, Miss um, Emily Baxter wanted to know uh, last year in our plan to release the notice of sale in the end of last year. Um, was that ever released? She wants to know, which no. And was it held for these updates that we're seeing today? Correct. Correct. We've been holding it uh, this whole time. And so, yeah, after the last meeting, really, we spent uh, several months um, talking with the community members after the last uh, after the last meeting. Um, several members came in, talked with Council Member Firestone. I tried to attend as many meetings as possible. So really just trying to understand the voices of the community um, and, and the concerns from both sides. So that so yes, so we basically held off on issuing. Um, and so the plan right now is to basically issue um, after the appraisal is updated. So in July. So then another question from Matt Motes, he wanted a reminder if the green space option were to be what happens, what is the percentage of reduction of flood risk? He studies seems to recall 5% reduction of, of flow. You could address that. Mm -hmm. Right, so I don't know a percentage off the top of my head, um, but if we if we took these uh, these we would if we did detention, we would take the nine city owned properties as well as the two FEMA. So the two FEMA can be converted into a detention basin. They have to remain green space. Um, so we could uh, basically take all eleven properties, create a stormwater detention basin. It would be very small, um, and so I'm not going to like say it's going to provide this giant amount of flood risk but because it's not um and so for reference um the basin at hewlin and bryce across from walgreens so that basin as well as the under street detention that we've constructed out there i think that is total around 5.5 acre feet um and so for perspective uh, i'm trying to remember the numbers off the top of my head i think if we wanted to mitigate flooding in the the central Arlington Heights area, I'm thinking we needed like 130 acre feet um, of stormwater detention, and I'm throwing that out there. It's in my presentation from last year, um, <laughs> and so I don't have the number off the top of my head right now. But so you can see um, the 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 size of the basin um, at at across from Walgreens is 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 pretty small, uh, similar to kind of what it would be. For these, um, so I would say, you know, maybe a couple acre feet. Um, and so, just so everyone understands, you know, what is an acre feet? Because I, I never like know. When, um, so I kind of think of a football field. So a football field is a little over an acre, but say it's an acre. Um, and so an acre foot would be a football field covered with one foot of water. So if we constructed stormwater detention out here, maybe we could get around two acre feet. Um, so a football field covered by two feet of water, um, but big picture, we would need around 130 ish acre feet to mitigate the 100 year flooding in the Arlington Heights area. So, um, but I want to say right now that the residents that live downstream of the basin um, and of the understreet detention, we have heard many times um, how successful that is and that it does provide flood mitigation resident, um, benefits to the community. And so it would be some more additional flood mitigation out there. All right, so um, Carrie, you might've had your question, your next question answered when um, Jennifer was answering Wiley's question. It's about um, if a city, once a city engineer signs off on a development, will the city have to approve changes and modifications is what her question was. Yeah, Linda, I think that um, she did answer that. So okay. thank you. Yeah. Um, what about things so that are I not permanent? Yes, like, I do have um, what about like driveways, like changing a gravel driveway to a cement driveway is like anything like that. It doesn't, is that out of scope? So that, that would need to be included in the, um, in the plans that they submit, because when we're going to look at in terms of like absorption rates of stormwater, 
um, there's, you know, a difference between between gravel or between, you know, asphalt or concrete. Um, so that would be something that we would look at and factor in, because if they change that later on, you know, if they had it as gravel before, and then later on, it became concrete that could, uh, of course, have more stormwater runoff. So something like that, we would have to look at. Okay, thanks. Okay, and, and Jennifer Moody had a question. Will the de development guidelines hold forth for future permits from new homeowners? And you kind of re so, refer to this. When yes. they decide to add to the properties in a way that, that aggravates the situation, for example, driveways, porches, other additions. Gotcha. So, good question. Uh, and I, I meant to mention that, and I did not. Um, so, no, so basically once these conditions um, are met and we sign off and say, you know, for this 1st development, these conditions are met, um, then in the future, um, you know, someone could come in and they could do modifications and it would just go through the normal city permitting process. So if they need to go get a pool, they would go and do the normal city permitting process to get a pool. Um, so the big thing was, is that we just don't have the capacity to maintain these higher level um, of standards for, you know, continued redevelopment in these properties, um, just because we don't do that for any other. So they would follow any other um, just normal city permitting process with two exceptions. So those two exceptions are like, say, for example, a tornado came through and ripped down one of these new properties. Um, and so the house was demolished. So, in that case, um, the exception is that new house is going to have to come in and be built again 2 feet above the base flood elevation. So we, the big thing is, you know, we took down those the homes right now. We bought those homes out because they were highly flood prone and we were continuing to flood. And so we don't want that to happen ever again. Um, so we want to put in, so in the deeds right now um, is that any future sales, the home finished floor is going to have to be 2 feet above the base flood elevation. That one, as well as there's information about like a flood risk disclosure. So we just want to make sure that whoever purchases this property, it's already kind of like, uh, well, hmm, the, the home's elevated. There's got to be a reason, but we wanted to make it really clear that there's flood risk out there. And so there's um, information in the deed that will have them basically have to acknowledge. Yes, I understand there's flood risk out there. So, um, Matt has a follow up Matt Motes to an earlier question, which is. If, um, underground, um, retention ponds were put in. Would it reduce the water flow by say 5%? He can't re remember the acronym for. The water flow, and maybe we've already addressed that question. Matt, do you feel like you got your answer? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to me, it doesn't matter. I mean, if it's if it's underground or above ground, um, you know, these little pockets of detention, it's just going to be really, really small. Um, and so, and, and two, I will say, you know, I think I threw out there, you know, maybe we could get two acre feet out here if we turned these eleven properties into the de de detention. A big part of how much we get is is what it's going to look like and how deep we can go. And we really would want to work with the community and get feedback on the design of the stormwater detention. And so if there's a lot of concern uh, with going really, really deep and we look at something shallower, we're not going to get as much detention. Um, and so we're going to need to, to try to balance the community concerns uh, with really, you know, if we do detention, we want to try to get as much as possible as well to try to protect people as much as possible and provide as much flood mitigation as possible. So there's gonna be a balancing act there, um, but that design um, and look and feel of the detention basin, um, that, will, that will impact how much capacity we can actually get. Hey, Jennifer. Hey, Matt, Scott. Thing there? Yes, please. I'm so this is, uh, hold on, Scott, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, you bet. So my name is Scott Hubley. I work at Free Nichols. I'm one of the engineers who's worked with the city on this for many years. Um, one other point on the detention is that it kind of determ or depends on the scale of the storm. So like the smaller the storm, the more impact that detention will have. But if you have this kind of big 100 year flood that we're regulating around, it has it has very minimal impact on that. But kind of the normal annual big rainstorms. 
it would help in those events. Thank you, Scott. Good point. We have quite a few more in the chat and we're coming close to being over and we need to answer all these questions. So the next one is from uh, first in National G. Willers. We live on Western and a flood prone area, yet our property taxes continue to go up. Is the city taking measures to address that issue? So, uh, so that's one thing is um, I have talked with residents before that have taken um, information about their flood risk to the appraisal district um, and use that to protest uh, their property values. I don't know how it turned out, but I've talked with residents before who have done that. Um, and so that's what I would recommend is, is providing them with information on your flood risk um, and see, you know, but that's something that, that, that TAD does that. That's not a city of Fort Worth thing. Um, but that is something is, is you can use that data for the, or if there's some specific type of data um, that you would like us to, to help provide, uh, reach out and we'll see if we can provide you with some information. All right, so next uh, question in the chat or comment is from Monica Merchant, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right, um, saying that one developer's feedback to her uh, received after sending them the draft notice of sale was something to the effect of, I'm not sure if they, meaning the city, Stormwater, <clears throat> wrote this intentionally to deter developers from investing in this, or if it's just a case of bureaucrats not understanding business, <clears throat> but nobody is gonna take this on with the price they are wanting for it. So her question is, the city open to bids that go below the asking price, especially since the real estate market has cooled since the appraisals were done. And obviously you answered part of that question, Jennifer, when we're gonna get a adjustment on the appraisal due to the market change. Mm -hmm. But did you wanna address any of the rest of that? Right. So, uh, so, I mean, to me, we, we put these regulations in place um, to, to one, protect the, the future development um, and then to protect the current uh, property owners. And so what we're asking the developer to do is really in terms of flood protection is really not very different from anywhere else in the city of Fort Worth where there's flood risk. And so we, we have a right now a building two feet above uh, the, that finished floor elevation two feet above the 100 flood risk, that's anywhere in the city of Fort Worth. Uh, so that's not unique to the Arlington Heights neighborhood. Um, and so we've got that in place. Um, in terms of the, the other criteria, uh, like the garages in the back of the properties or, um, you know, maintaining the look and the feel of the houses so they look very similar to the ones up and down the street, all of that feedback was received um, pretty much from different property owners um, in the Arlington Heights Neighborhood Association in that area. And so, so that's something that, you know, that's not really coming from the city. It's the feedback that we've received from the community that it's important that if this is redeveloped, that it fits the current community cohesiveness. Um, so potentially, you know, that's something that we could take out of the notice of sale. Um, but I also don't feel like that it's unreasonable to ask for those types of things. Uh, a lot of that information, I talked with development services, it's very similar like in the Fairmount neighborhood to ask for those types of uh, things in different like historical places on, or across the city. We've got a little bit higher development standards. And so these are very similar to those. Um, and then, yeah, I think I already answered in terms of the appraisal that we will be updating the appraisal. So it'll take into account uh, both the, you know, the changing market conditions since last fall, as well as um, the uh, the development requirements. And then, too, it takes into account that these properties are flood prone properties and they're having to develop, um, you know, to these higher standards. So all of that is taken into account in the value um, that the appraisal that the appraiser comes up with. And so we use a totally independent appraiser. Um, and we're required to use that value. So that sets our value. We can't go lower than that. I think I think I addressed all the questions. And then Jennifer Moody had a follow up to her earlier question about um, the developer who purchases, potentially purchases the nine properties. 
So um, Jennifer Moody, um, when Jennifer Dyke was explaining the presentation, she was saying that the um, if a developer chooses to sell these properties to someone else, the new buyer is bound by the standards as well. So your question about you know can the re developer sell it to someone and then the who they flip it to as you phrase could come in and violate the standards? No, they couldn't. Um, because according to what we've set up. Um, they would have to stick with the standards as well. Correct. Am I answering that correctly? Yes. yes. Yeah. If it's yeah, if they if they okay. sell it and and that was part of it is as we had that discussion like, can we make them not sell it? You know, we just want to work with one developer. Uh, but kind of it, it kind of came down to it seemed like it wasn't something that the city could really enforce that. Um, and two, it could impact in terms of a a developer or one of these. Um, groups that wants to bid on it, it could make it more challenging for them to get the financing if if they're, um, you know, whoever they're getting the financing sees that, like, you're stuck with this. Once you buy it, you can never get out if you're experiencing problems or anything like that. So we wanted them to have the ability to sell, um, to, to help in terms of getting finance to show it's not like they're stuck into this commitment evermore. So then, Mr. Breland, I think that probably answers your question, which was you wanted clarification if a successful bidder um, can that develop. Turn around and resell to 9 individuals and that is not yet but they'll down to the standards. Um, so, hopefully that answers Correct. that question and then. Bert Wilhelm. Uh, wants to know if we're going to be posting the revised appraisal report. Um, I, yeah, I think that we can post that once we receive it. I mean, it will become public uh, data and I know that we had the old appraisal report online. Um, and so it, it becomes a part of the document once it's out there. Uh, so I don't see a problem with that. Niels, do you have any concerns with posting that once we receive it? Uh, no, as as a matter of fact, I thought it was going to be part of the notice of sale. Right. That's yeah. Okay. Yeah, it becomes a, basically an attachment to that document. So once we get it updated, um, yeah, we can post that on the website and let everyone know that it's out there as well. But it will become an attachment uh, because we want to make so, sure it's um, really clear. Jennifer Dyke. Linda, I think you're breaking up. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. okay. So, um, Je Jennifer, Jennifer Moody still has a follow up question um, regarding if we sell all nine properties to a successfully to a developer, they re redevelop them. Is her question? They sell those properties. She's her follow up is. If they meet the requirements, but they sell the property to someone else, that someone else decides to add on outside the requirements, which could meet, which could create more flooding issues. I think that's that's what she's trying to get at. Is that possible? so? So the city. So basically, until the city signs off that each one of these lots meets all of the notice of sale requirements, like. They, the whoever buys them is responsible for meeting those requirements. And so we're not going to sign off and allow someone to move into each property. Like, say, they were all sold off. We're not going to sign off and say someone, you know, you pass final inspection, let people move into that house until they meet all of the, the notice of sale requirements. Um, so once they meet them all, if they go through, they meet everything. Um, and we sign off and say, yes, you know, you're done. You've met all the conditions. So at that point in time, they could sell to somebody totally different um, that decides I want to go, you know, do other things. Um, and then they're not held to those conditions anymore, but they would still have to go through the normal city permitting process um, for anything that would require a permit. So, you know, a swimming pool or adding a, an additional garage and so forth. So a follow up 
to all of that from Colin Baxter about the notice of sale, the timing. He's wondering, last year, the plan was to move forward with notice of sale terms or to do a green space. He's, he's saying it seems like those terms didn't fly with developers, but the city is trying to accommodate with new terms. Might the same thing happen this time around pre-release? So, so what we did after that last meeting is we, we did get feedback uh, from de some developers and that's, that's why we changed some of the things in the notice of sale in terms of giving them more time that the notice is out there. So they have more time to do their due diligence and put together a proposal and really understand, you know, what's out there and not just say, you know, wow, this sounds challenging. I'm not even going to like look at it because the deadline's really quick. Um, so we changed that as well as we gave them more time um, to be able to do all of their design and, and permitting and construction and so forth. So we really were trying to um, make it more flexible for the developer to try to make this as successful as possible. So Mr. Vreeland uh, commented, try to keep the footprint similar to existing as much as possible. He's quoting you, Jennifer. Can they still build to the city normal requirement of 50% coverage? <clears throat> so they're gonna have to basically show through their engineering evaluations that what they're doing is not aggravating the existing flood risk. And so with that, um, you know, that that's a big part right now is looking at the existing impervious surface that's out there and then making sure that if they're adding more impervious surface, how are they offsetting that? Um, as well as keeping those, maintaining those existing flow paths. Um, so, so I feel like that, you know, the restrictions that we put in place um, really does make it so they can't just go out and maximize um, the amount of impervious surface out there on those properties. Which ties into, again, Jennifer Movie has um, another follow-up comment and saying, in other words, we will now have to rely on permitting to keep our neighborhood from flooding due to these lots in the future, which clearly the city has been lax with over the years. So, so right now, I mean, anyone, you know, could come into the Arlington Heights community anywhere in there and redevelop a lot. Um, so that can happen anywhere if they want to go in. Um, yeah, the city permitting would, you know, they'd have to comply with whatever the city permitting is to redevelop the lot. Um, I will say that we have been working for the last couple, probably two or three years now, um, on what we're calling um, some non FEMA flood risk regulations uh, for areas um, like Arlington Heights, as well as other parts of the community where we have a very good understanding of the flood risk out there um, that's not on FEMA maps. So we call these non FEMA flood risks. Um, and where we want to put in place a, a higher, um, basically a, a, an additional development standard. So just like um, when someone goes into another area um, and they have to develop right now, I guess like for a small one lot development, if someone came into Arlington Heights, they're not gonna have to do this big um, flood, flood evaluation of the flooding that's out there, but we wanna put regulations in place um, for Arlington Heights, as well as other areas with this type of flood risk. So when someone comes in and does a small lot development um, that's in the area that where flood risk has been mapped, they're having to then um, fill out basically a certificate acknowledging, yes, I'm aware of the flood risk, and this is what I'm doing in my development to make sure that th what I'm developing uh, doesn't flood and then they're not making flood risk um, worse for somebody else. And so that's something that we uh, working to take those regulations to council uh, because we want to better protect uh, current residents and future residents that are building in these flood prone areas. So it's something that we are working on. All right, and Carrie, I'm going to get to yours last because it's a little more specific. Um, instead of broad. So the next question in the chat is from Colin Baxter um, saying, so in a year, will we be talking about a 60 month term notice of sale or is this one the final terms pending the appraisal? So this is it. So basically what we what we 
presented today and what's on the website, that's it. Now, I did say, you know, that if you've got any additional questions or comments or feedback to provide them to me next Friday. So we'll take a look at that. And, you know, I really want to be listening to the community. So potentially maybe we'll get some feedback um, that would have us modify um, the conditions. Um, and so we'll take that into account. But the whole plan is by next Friday, you know, we cut it off. We look at our feedback. We see if we need to tweak anything. You know, we're really trying to make this something that the community wants that's going to be successful um, to get that redevelopment to happen. Um, that's good for the community. So, but that's the plan is basically to cut it off, update it, and then finalize it because we want to give it to the appraiser. And we're going to need to say this is it because they're going to base their valuation on the developer having to follow those conditions. Okay, and then Carrie's uh, back to Carrie Richards, um, which again, it's <clears throat> specific to her, but I think there's a bearing on it for everybody. Her entire uh, backyard floods over three feet. I don't understand why the city didn't buy her house, this house, and regardless of the lines on the map, my entire backyard was underwater in 2022 and water was also underneath my house. Can you please discuss the cost of city flood insurance since my private insurance was canceled after I had a claim? Is it a lot more expensive? And Claire Davis um, can probably help answer your question, Carrie. Sure, well, the, the city's flood insurance is really the national flood insurance program, flood insurance. Um, it's gonna be available through any of your uh, insurance agents and it's available now for anyone in the city, in the city at a 15% discount because of some of the other uh, stormwater management uh, operations that we do that earn us a discount through the community rating system. So I would check with any insurance provider that you work with, uh, anyone that you're, you're used to working with. If, if the one that you work with now is the one that canceled that policy, uh, see if they have the National Flood Insurance Program uh, insurance instead, and you should be able to get a, a reduced rate uh, premium through them or through that program. And that's available to anybody in the city if they're in a floodplain or not. And then I want to go back up uh, early in the chat. Um, G. Willers had um, had a follow up comment to um, an earlier question stating that we have done that and nothing changes. So I've lost a little track of what the question original question was. Would you are you able to turn on your microphone and clarify with Jennifer what you're referring to there? It was the you property might... taxes. That was the response that property taxes. It wasn't me, but that was the response that they said they basically tried okay. to protest around. It didn't work. It was that's that response. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so this is uh, Niels Brown, the real property manager. As far as the property taxes, at, at least from a market standpoint, um, it, it's really based on the market value of the home. And so if the market value of the home continues to go up, whether it's in a flood prone area or not, uh, then the property taxes are going to continue to go up. Thank you, Niels. Hey, Jennifer, it's why I asked a question about the community board. When are you going to start pulling people in and how, how do you get on that to, to be involved? Right. Yeah, I would say um, shoot me an email. I have a list from people who've asked already. Um, so I'm maintaining the list. Um, so uh, so shoot me an email afterwards. I, I think I've got my email. I know you have it um, at the end of this. Um, and and basic, so yeah, that's the key is like trying to keep it a small manageable group. And that's kind of where I came up with, you know, 10 property owners on Western, 10 on Carlton, and two from the overall neighborhood association. So um, so we'll be looking to see really kind of where people live, really trying to focus on the, the people who live, you know, adjacent to, across from, um, just like as close as possible to those um to those residents. Um, so we'll just we'll have to see, you know, how many we get that are interested and look at the locations um, and try to try to use that information to to reduce that number. For sure, for sure. Thanks. Is there anything else, Linda? 
That's all the what we have in chat. Okay. Well, I uh, thank you all for sticking around. I know we went a little bit over time, um, but I'm really glad. I know it's it's it feels like at least for me, it helps for someone to discuss my questions versus just sending an email. Um, and if you think of questions afterwards, please feel free to uh, send me an email. Um, Monday's a holiday, but uh, but I'll try to follow up later next week. So thank you all. Um, again, we will be posting the recording. Um, so Linda will be working with the web team. It'll probably be you know early to mid next week just because of the holiday, but we'll try to get out the recording as soon as possible. Um, and again, right now that um, the criteria for the design uh, guidelines are up there on the website right now for y'all. So thank you again for participating tonight. Y'all have a good night. Thank you.